Welcome to In 5 Minutes. The agenda of this clip is to understand the different methodologies to reduce dynamic power. In the previous clip, we have already seen static power, the components which contribute to static power, and we also saw a few techniques to reduce static power. We also saw the basics of dynamic power. Now, in this clip, we will understand how to minimize dynamic power, and then finally, in one of the other clips, we will see the low power design considerations which are going to be very important for a designer. Let's quickly get started. In the previous clip, we have already seen that dynamic power is equal to alpha, which is nothing but the switching activity factor, into the load capacitance CL, VDD square, into frequency. We have already seen this over a time interval of T, and we have found this value. In real sense, this is not the complete dynamic power. This is nothing but the switching power, which I have shown here. Because dynamic power constitutes of two parts, one is a switching power, which is already seen on your screen. Another one is a short circuit power. Now, what is a short circuit power or dissipation? It's nothing but, suppose, let's say this is my inverter. And we all know that our inputs are not idle. It has finite rise time and finite fall time. It might so happen that at specific inputs, both my PMOS and NMOS transistors are turned on. In that case, there will be a direct path from VDD to ground for the current to flow and this is nothing but the short circuit power dissipation. For this clip, we are focusing on switching power which I am going to call it as dynamic power and we will see how to reduce it. Now, dynamic power can be reduced if I reduce any of these four terms. Switching activity factor, load capacitance CL, it has quadratic, VDD has a quadratic effect on dynamic power. So if I can reduce this, it would be a great help or if I can reduce frequency. Let's quickly understand how we can do this or is it possible to reduce this to a drastic extent so that we can save or we can reduce the dynamic power dissipation. Now let's start with switching activity factor alpha. A switching activity factor alpha is equal to one for a clock. We have already seen this in a previous clip. Why it is one for a clock? Because suppose this is my clock in one cycle, this one cycle, my clock rise and fall both takes place in one cycle so alpha is highest for a clock most of the data inputs will switch only once in this cycle so if that's the case only one switching is happening then they would have a switching activity factor of 0.5 however the static logic gates or static cmos logic have a very low activity factor something equal to 0.1 when i say static this was nothing but a static inverter right ideally the inputs of the static gates don't change for quite a few cycles because the output is steady and if that is happening then the switching activity factor for static gates is very low and hence the dynamic power dissipation for them for static gates is going to be very low however in case of dynamic circuits we have already seen dynamic inverters dynamic nands and so on and so forth we know that because there are clocks present to drive the dynamic circuits that activity factor is going to be high and hence is there any possible way where we can reduce this then it would be a boon in saving the dynamic power so there is a way because in sequential circuits right on an ic where there are sequential blocks all the blocks are not active at the same time some blocks are in use let's say an example this is an ic which has a lot of sequential blocks sequential means all of them are driven by clock and clock leads to a major chunk of dynamic power dissipation now you would see that all the blocks are not active at the same time some blocks might be active depending on what application or depending on what you are looking to do with your inputs or what type of processing you are looking to do. So all blocks are not used simultaneously and this gives us a very good opportunity to reduce dynamic power. So the technique which we use here is nothing but a clock getting technique where clock to an idle portion. So as we said that these are some of the blocks, this might be used but this all blocks might be idle and they might not be doing any computation. So the clock to an idle portion is disabled and when the clock is disabled we see that the switching activity factor will drastically reduce and this will help us in saving some of the dynamic power dissipation. This is a typical scenario in a typical synchronous circuit such as say a microprocessor only a portion of the circuit would be active at a given time and hence if we can shut down the idle portion of the circuit idle means which is not active the necessary power consumption can be prevented. Now, how can we do this? As I mentioned, it's clock gating or it's nothing but masking the clock. Let's quickly understand that. Suppose this is my latch, which is operating on clock and this is my input to the latch. Now, what might happen is we might see that this latch is idle for a long period of time. So we will not give it a clock 
to its we will not give it a clock to its internal clock what we will do is we will give it a gated clock which means that this is an output of an AND gate which has an input clock and enable so whenever this circuit is active that time enable will go high and then whenever the positive edge comes on the clock then this circuit would be triggered. Let's understand this to the waveform. This is clock, this is enable and this is gated clock. So when the enable is low, it means this latch is not active. Here we want the latch to compute. So whenever the next clock edge comes, it should start processing and that's exactly what I've drawn here. In this cycle or in this edge, the clock will take or the latch will take the new clock or will take its input clock and correspondingly take a new input and process it. So what we are doing here is in the remaining cycle of the clock when the latch is not needed the enable signal is low and hence we can make our clock to be disabled for such an idle case and hence save on some dynamic power dissipation so that is nothing but clock gating for you let's go ahead and understand the next thing which is reducing the load capacitance now let's say there is an inverter which is driving another inverter the output of this inverter is going to the input of the next one so there will be in some load capacitance i have approximated this load capacitance to be nothing but some interconnect capacitance we already saw interconnects so interconnects would have some capacitance and nothing but the gate of this guy correct it's driving the gate so c load is nothing but approximately equal to interconnect capacitance plus the gate capacitance of the next stage or inverter 2 in this case now if we want to reduce load capacitance we have to reduce interconnect capacitance or gate capacitance and if we can reduce both it would be fantastic so interconnect capacitance are technically reduced by floor planning again we are not going into the details of this floor planning can help us in reducing the interconnect capacitance floor planning will tell us exactly how do you want your circuit or your interconnects to be connected with different blocks on your ic gate capacitance now how can the gate capacitance be reduced we know that gate capacitance is nothing but cox into w into l so if i reduce the width of this guy or we should not touch the length because length is nothing but the process in which you are working in or the technology in which you are working in so i'm not getting into this and this is a very important parameter when we go to analog designs currently let's focus only on w so when the w is reduced the gate capacitance is reduced that means the load capacitance can be reduced but what will happen if i reduce my w see if i zoom into this if i reduce my w i know that id is proportional to w correct directly proportional we have seen that and we have also seen that r is inversely proportional to w if that's the case what's going to happen here is your r will increase if you keep on reducing the w correct and if r increases your delay of this specific block which is nothing but r into c will increase so this guy will become slow correct now it's okay if one of the guys becomes slow if suppose this is your circuit and this is your input and this is your output and there's so many paths going from input to output and the path which you are concerned with is this path which is also called as a critical path then in this path you should not make your circuit slow but in rest of all the paths you can definitely make your circuit slow because they are not your critical path again critical path is a very interesting topic to understand the worst case analysis from your input to the output on basis of which you can find your frequency currently it's beyond the scope what you need to understand is the delay is not or you can slow down your transistors which don't come in your critical path so that's okay so that we can reduce the load capacitance and save on some other dynamic power so this is the second parameter let's quickly go ahead and see the third one reducing vdd now we are going to have an exclusive clip on this where we will talk about how we can reduce power through voltage scaling and at that point of time we will discuss about vdd as well but for the time being let's quickly understand if we reduce our vdd we know that dynamic power is proportional to vdd square so that will help us in considerably reducing our dynamic power now i've written this just for your reference i have derived this also in some of the clips previously but you don't have to remember what you are expected to know here is if you look at the equation very closely if you keep on reducing your vdd what's going to happen is your delay is going to keep on increasing so you will make your circuit very very slow so that's going to be a trade-off and we will see whether that trade-off depending on the application whether it's a good idea to reduce vdd to a certain value or below it so that's the third parameter reduction of vdd the fourth one is reducing the frequency right if you go ahead and see the equation 
it was alpha switching activity factor load capacitance vdd and frequency again if i reduce my frequency i know that the time is we know time period is inversely proportional to frequency so reducing the frequency will increase the time period or the delay and that will make my circuit slower but in circuits where more than delay which are concerned with throughput throughput again is a detailed area of understanding it means the rate of change of output which is ideally the case in case of digital signal processing systems or in pipeline systems so they are more concerned with throughput so with such systems you can go ahead and do this and still it will help you in saving the power and give you a better performance and you will not lose out on quite a lot so i hope in this clip you have understood the four parameters ideally which contribute to switching power which i have said here is a major part and i have labeled this as dynamic power so dynamic power is a combination of switching and short circuit and we also saw how to reduce it hope you have followed stay tuned for further clips and thank you very much